Wisconsin, but I'm going to hand it over to our Citizen Action Northeast Wisconsin organizing co-op organizer, uh, Jolie Lizette, to welcome everyone. So great to see so many faces here today. Uh, real quick, I want to find out where everybody is from. So can we get a raise of hands who's from Brown County? Here in the Northeast. Um, each candidate will have 60 seconds to respond. 
Um, and then when we wrap up, we'll have some closing remarks too. Um, so hopefully some of you got a chance to, to meet the candidates before you sat down here today. Um, I'm sure many of them will be able to stick around too for a few minutes and, and talk to you all afterwards as well. Um, so I'm hoping today you'll get plenty of chances to hear from the candidates. And we are live streaming, yes. <laughs> so, um, we, you will be able to share this on Facebook as well. So any of your friends and family who are not able to make it here today, or if you have to leave early and miss the last few questions, please go to our Facebook, Citizen Action Northeast Wisconsin page, and you can find um, the link there as well. Um, or you can send a quick text to your friends and tell them to jump on Facebook and watch this from their home. All right, so. I'm going to turn it over now to the candidates. Um, in, oops. I'm going to do something too. Oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you everyone. Uh, Robert Craig, Executive Director, Citizen National Wisconsin. Uh, just to reiterate, this is part of our endorsement process. So we're a statewide grassroots organization, and as Jolie said, we were organized in terms of organizing cooperatives, which are member-run democratic uh, organizations in each region. And so the, all the questions you're going to hear from the members of the Northeast Wisconsin Co-op are from our eight-year... Mm. <laughs> Thanks, Walker. <laughs> <laughs> okay, someone doesn't, want, someone doesn't want our eight-year platform. So members across the state developed this platform and it was unanimously approved by our two boards of directors and by our annual member meeting in December. And this is a very bold platform. It's what a really progressive governor, the next fighting Bob LaFala, would do in eight years. So part of what we're looking at here is which of these candidates could be that next fighting Bob LaFala. And so, uh, and what's happening is the reason the surveys are so important is because they're going into a process. We, are, we did this in Eau Claire, in Wausau, Milwaukee, now up here in the Northeast, uh, for our board to get actual feedback from members across the state and others who, who, who come to the forums as well in order to figure out whether or not they can endorse any of these candidates. But even if that doesn't happen, we're buying an opportunity for these candidates to take bold stands on the future of Wisconsin, which is absolutely essential, we believe. So there's a secondary goal here that's also very, very, very important. And so the other thing is, I see a lot of uh, familiar faces, but I see some people that I've not met before. So if you're interested in joining the Northeast Wisconsin Organizing Cooperative, fill out the card, and even if you're not sure you want to join yet, Jolie can call you and she can talk to you more about it. So we urge you, if you want to be involved in changing Wisconsin, uh, to consider joining the co-op and at least agree to have a conversation with Jolie. So with that, Jolie is going to moderate the questions from members. Cool, all right, so I'm going to give each candidate a chance really quick to introduce yourself. Um, That's really quick. 90 seconds. 90 seconds. <laughs> so, uh, we've got Rhonda up there, uh, one of our very active members from the Appleton area, and she is going to be have these wonderful color signs um, to give you all warnings um, so you know when to like say your last few words. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and we do have a lot of questions from our members today, um, so don't worry, you will have lots of time and closing your remarks as well. Um, so don't feel like you have to cram everything into, into your 90 seconds. All right, um, so, Malin, yeah, <laughs> I knew that. <laughs> um, but let's start with Malin and we'll go right down the line. Sound good? Great. Right. You can also use, these are all booked up here. All right, thank you all. How are we all doing? Good. We fired up? Yes! Well, my name is Malin Mitchell. I like to uh, call myself Bob Follow, but with color. <laughs> <laughs> but no, in all seriousness, my name is Malin Mitchell. I'm a state president of the Professional Firefighters of Wisconsin. Uh, I'm also a full-time firefighter in the city of Madison. I've been there 20 plus years. I got to meet a lot of you when I ran for a lieutenant governor in 2012. Uh, where I got 1,156,520 votes. <laughs> but you always know the number you lose by because you know the number it takes actually for us to bring this home. I also got to meet a lot of you uh, during Act 10 uh, when we as firefighters were uh, carved out, so to speak, and exempt from uh, the changes when it came to collective bargaining for public sector employees. But 
as I told you then and I'll tell you now, that we will not stop, we will never stop fighting. Uh, we will continue to make sure that we make the state what we know it can and what it was and what it could be. So that's why I'm running for governor. I look forward to discussing the issues with you. I have 30 seconds. Uh, I, I reside in Pittsburgh with my wife, uh, who would like to be here, but she's a flight attendant. She's actually in Pittsburgh right now. I have a daughter that goes to UW Oshkosh, not too far from here. She's a freshman, uh, just turned her freshman year, and I have a son who uh, in eighth grade public school. So I look forward to uh, talking about the issues, and thanks for uh, coming to the forum. Good morning. My name is Kelda Royce, and I'm running for governor because I want to restore opportunity and fairness to this state. And if we want to make the state a place where every child can succeed and has that opportunity, we've got to put a responsible adult in the driver's seat. I want to take just a minute to acknowledge uh, some great candidates. We've got a lot of great candidates in this race, but this week, um, two of our friends, Andy Gronick and Dana, Dana Walks, decided to suspend their campaign. And I just want to take a moment to acknowledge the sacrifices that they and their families made to go on this journey with us and say thank you to them. I think we've got a big task ahead of us, but I feel incredibly optimistic and hopeful as I travel around the state that people are ready to move Wisconsin forward again. We're ready to turn the page on the negativity and the division that we've experienced, and we're ready to make sure that this is a place where every child is gonna have the opportunity to succeed. I have a long track record of working on tough issues, reaching across the aisle, like when I helped to pass the first pro-choice law in our state in 30 years through an anti-choice Republican-controlled assembly, when I helped expand Badger Care to 80,000 Wisconsinites. We need a governor with those kind of skills to turn our big ideas into real results for Wisconsin families, and that's what I pledge to do. I'm a lawyer, a former legislative leader, I'm a parent to mom and a stepmom of four girls, and two of whom are upstairs in the library. I'm a small business owner. I'm ready to be your next governor. Thank you. I'm State Senator Kathleen Vinehout. I represent a large rural district from western Wisconsin. I'm also an organic farmer. I spent 10 years as a dairy farmer milking cows. My husband believed that you should have no more cows than your wife can milk. <laughs> So, when I got elected to the Senate, we sold the cows, but we got the farm certified, certified organic, and we now raise organic hay and organic grain for other organic farmers. So you probably know right now that the farm, farm business is really awful, and one of the things that motivated me back in 2006 when I ran for the, for the Senate was to bring health care to all, including farmers and small business people. Thank you. I'm running to put people first, people at the center of state policy, people number one when it comes to writing the state budget. I've done this in four alternatives that I've written to Governor Walker's budgets. First, I did it back in 2011 to show that the hurts that were happening in his first budget didn't have to happen. I showed how to balance the budget as well as uh, fix the problems that he created when he dropped the bomb and to completely change the way schools are funded so they're based on student needs and not an antiquated notion of property value. Thank you very much. Thanks for filling the room, everybody. Thanks for coming. I'm Mike McCabe. I got my start in life working the land and milking cows with my family. I am farm raised, grew up on a dairy farm. I've spent most of my adult life as an independent watchdog working to expose and break the grip of big money influence in politics and corruption that has taken root in our government. I want Wisconsin to be a place that stops feeding the rich and showering tax breaks and state subsidies on a few at the top with the hopes that they will work magic for the rest of us and instead I want our state to embrace geyser economics. Economic prosperity does not trickle down, it gushes up. That means empowering close to six million people in the state to do more for themselves and for each other. It means a state committed to a living wage for every worker, health care for all, debt-free education and job training for everyone, high-speed internet everywhere. I want Wisconsin to aim to be the first state in the country fully powered by renewable energy. We can have that Wisconsin, but not unless we do one other thing, and that is address the problem underneath all these other problems. 
we have allowed cronyism and corruption and what amounts to legal bribery to take root in our state. It must be uprooted. There is a cancer growing in the body of our democracy. We have to cut out that cancer. And when we do, then we can have a government that works for all of us and not just a wealthy and well-connected and privileged few at the very top. Yes. Thanks again for being here. Everybody. Good morning. I'm Matt Flynn, candidate for governor. Um, I'm a Navy veteran. I uh, was a chairman of this party for two terms. My wife Mary and I have been married for 41 years. Mary is a lifetime WEAC member. She taught as a speech pathologist in public school for more than 30 years, and we're a union household. Um, I am running, uh, and by the way, I wanted to thank the gentleman on the way in who looked at me and he said, uh, are you the Matt Flynn who played for the Green Bay Packers and threw the six touchdowns? <laughs> Thank you. That made my day, quite frankly. Yes, I'm no, I'm not. But I will say this. Um, there are many issues in this case, but, uh, this race, but I want to emphasize one right now, and that is Fox John. If we don't kill that deal, it's a crooked deal that's going to strangle us for 15 years. It's four and a half billion dollars to a company with a questionable record. We're going to let them come in and pollute Lake Michigan when they are right now under investigation in mainland communist China for polluting a tributary of the Yangtze River. I don't know why we're letting them in this country. The second thing is they're exempt from the wetlands laws, they're exempt from environmental impact statements, and they're exempt from the Court of Appeals jurisdiction. They're the only uh, corporation in the history of the state, including Miller Brewing Company and Harley Davidson, who don't have to follow the Court of Appeals. I'm the only candidate in this race that has laid out my plan to uh, we send that contract. Uh, it's in my area of expertise. When my wife and I married, we moved to Milwaukee and I practice law. I will stop the Foxconn deal. It's essential or we're going to be dead for 15 years. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> All right, so we are going to dive into some questions here today. Um, so again, just a reminder, you'll have 60 seconds. Please stick to the 60 seconds um, in respect to your fellow candidates and also so we can hear more uh, questions. So, we're gonna start off with immigration um, from our steering committee member, Tim Lewis, uh, who is active um, here in the Green Bay area. Thank you, Julie, and Kennedy. Um, we're seeing more and more Talking mass them. migration all across the world due to the web of political, economic, environmental, but primarily environmental, called global warming, climate change, which is overtaking the world, and it will be for years to come if we're still living in it. Um, what would your administration do to try and meet this challenge, not only in Wisconsin, but in the upper Midwest, and as part of this world that is going to be changing very, very deeply, and how would you go about trying to absorb some of the effects of it here? We're seeing, you know, not just the contemporary ones we're seeing to the south of our imaginary border, but that are going on all over the world. How would you try to help us begin to think forward and deal with this tremendous problem? Thank you. All right, we'll start with Tim Lewis. Yes, yeah, so how would you defend and protect the fundamental human rights of all immigrants, that, especially refugees that are... All right. How much time? 60, 60 seconds. 60 seconds. Don't, that doesn't count, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we have over close to 9,000 DACA recipients in the state of Wisconsin that are doing great things, that are giving back to society, um, that are um, helping Wisconsin, but helping the United States of America. We are a nation of immigrants. I mean, that's, that's what makes us great. But unfortunately, at the federal level, what we're seeing is, uh, when it comes to Donald Trump, at least, um, if you're black, the answer is more cops. If you're Mexican, the answer is build a wall. If you're Muslim, the answer is travel ban. So we have to do everything in our power and our control to make sure everyone feels safe and at home here. And when you actually start deporting folks, and we don't have places where people feel safe and have a safe haven, they go into shadows, and that makes it worse, because then they don't start telling uh, crimes that are being committed in their communities, and then we, we leave them a vulnerable people that are already much more vulnerable. So I would do everything in our power to make sure that we make everyone feel at home in the United States of America, because we are a nation of immigrants, and we thrive the better 
We thrive together when we have us all working together. In my mind, Tim, this question has never been more urgent. It goes to the fundamental question of what it means to be an American. And we need to be a welcoming state, and not a state where people, wherever they come from, and however they got here, feel like they cannot turn to our law enforcement for safety, and our law enforcement is being corrupted and used to further uh, the racist aims of a president who has made it very clear what his goals are. I would certainly uh, call, recall our National Guard. I would not allow our police force to be used to, um, for ICE's uh, enforcement. I've called for the dissolution of ICE, and I've called on Governor Walker to do the same. I supported in-state tuition in the legislature and driver's cards for um, undocumented uh, Wisconsinites. And I think we have to do everything in our power, including sue the Trump administration to reunite the families that have been separated. As a mother of two young children, I just cannot imagine the fact that we are now building and detaining people who are seeking safety from violence. It's unconscionable. This is a, a very real problem that is happening, not just down on the border, but right here in our neighborhoods. I am a senator from western Wisconsin, and one of the cities I represent is Arcadia, where 86% of the primary grades are English learners that are Hispanic, many of them undocumented. ICE came into Arcadia at 2.30 in the morning, shined spotlights in people's windows, and disappeared people. And I got calls from the school counselors the next day, hearing about families who were horrified at what had happened. And then heard about farmers who lost their workers because they were afraid. So what can the state do? We need driver's license, and all the farmers want that. We need to make sure the kids have in-state tuition. But we also need to use all the resources of the state to protect these people, to make sure that the legislature never passes a bill that would ban sanctuary cities. The issue of immigration is a perfect illustration of why we desperately need a very different kind of leadership and a new politics in our state. Dispatching National Guard troops to, to the southern border to engage in what is effectively child abuse, separating children from, from their parents, that is, that is immoral, uh, that is unconscionable, it shouldn't happen. Our state should not be on the side of participating in that kind of action. Wisconsin should become a safe harbor for dreamers. We should actively resist federal immigration policy. We should embrace and seek to act as a national model in, in creating a welcoming and hospitable environment for immigrant populations rather than one that is hostile. That is all about creating different leadership for our state that will set a tone that is distinctly different than the tone that is underneath current federal immigration policy. I lived in Mexico for two years as a boy. My father's doing research. Um, I went to the second and third grade down there. Y para la gente aquí pueden que pueden hablar español, yo asistí a la escuela Fray Juan de Sumaraga. Fuimos cada domingo al parque Chapultepec para jugar, manejar bicicletas. Tengo muchos amigos en México. I've been on the other side of this. Obviously, I wasn't suffering, but I was the only American kid in an all Spanish school, believe me, Mexican school. Couldn't even read the exams the first two months. Um, I will not permit anybody to be abused in this country, period, end of story. And when you take an infant away from a mother, that is one of the most disgusting things that I can imagine. I mean, it's, it's inhuman. Abraham Lincoln wouldn't have done it. Franklin Roosevelt wouldn't have done it. Harry Truman wouldn't have done it. And John F. Kennedy wouldn't have done it. And these are people I've looked up to, obviously, a great deal. So in conclusion, I just say this. Um, we need, it, it matters if Donald Trump is president or John F. Kennedy, if Scott Walker is president or Matt Flynn, we're going to restore decency to this governorship. Right now, what the Republican Party has done is inhuman. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next question is going to be on Fair Max. Uh, so turn over to Renee Gash, who has been a big co-leader here um, in the Northeast, leading this movement for Fair Max. Thank you. So over half of all Wisconsin counties, representing nearly two-thirds of the state's population, have passed resolutions calling on the state to end gerrymandering 
and to adopt an independent, nonpartisan process for drawing our election maps in Wisconsin. What is your position on redistricting reform? If elected, would you support and actively work to ensure nonpartisan redistricting legislation to eliminate gerrymandering? And here's the trick question. What if your preferred party is elected in, into the majority in the state legislature, which would allow it to gerrymander to its own advantage? Would you still use your role as governor in the process to block partisan maps and establish an independent process? You know, I am uh, totally against gerrymandering, and, and, and I don't care. I get in trouble for sometimes saying this, but even when Democrats are in control, they gerrymander as well. So we need to not have that happen no matter, and it's not just about us right here, right now. It's about the future of the state of Wisconsin. Um, it's about our children. So we need to get rid of gerrymandering. I think it's actually one thing that a Democratic governor can work on with, even if we have a Republican Senate, let's say a Republican Assembly. Um, but regardless of the party, there should never be a time where elected officials are picking the people they want to represent. It's the other way around. And going further than just gerrymandering, we, got, we have to look at voter ID, voter registration, voter ID, because they call it voter registration, and we know what it is, it's voter suppression. They know that when people of color, people that look like me get out to vote, they have time, they lose. Um, so that's what they've done. We have to look at them uh, expunging the rolls, the, the voter files, like they did in Ohio, they've done like 30,000 right here in Milwaukee. We haven't heard uh, a lot about that. So there's a lot we need to do when it comes to voting. And voting is a right, and we have to take that seriously, but gerrymandering is wrong no matter what party. Thank you. Renee, gerrymandering is wrong, and we have to do so much more to restore our democracy. I was a longtime board member of Common Cause, and I worked not only on trying to pass an Iowa-style redistricting plan, but also to get big money out of our politics and pass public campaign finance, which we actually used to have in this state, um, and especially for the judiciary, expanding access to vote and making sure we have universal adult franchise, ending prison gerrymandering, which is one of the most um, offensive forms of gerrymandering. You know, this issue is pretty personal for me because when I was in the state assembly, and we were in the majority, we had the opportunity to do this. I and a number of my colleagues had sponsored an Iowa-style independent redistricting bill, and we had a fight against our leadership in the dying days of our majority. After we had lost the election, we were lame ducks, and we could not get our leadership to go along. It is wrong, but I'm willing to stand up to my own party's leadership, and as governor, I will certainly fight for fair maps, and I will veto any maps, any maps that give an unfair partisan advantage, and I will take steps to restore our democracy so that you all are in charge. I have several times worked with my colleagues in the Senate to create the legislation that would create a nonpartisan entity like Iowa. I've also worked with my clerks and who have taught me that the software to do this already exists and be, is being used at the local level to draw the supervisory districts. So when I put together my alternatives to the governor's budget, I put $100,000 into the budget to do nonpartisan maps and then learned that we didn't, it didn't even cost that much money. That's how simple it would be if we could get the votes to, to move. And we could, as a state, put a tremendous, and as governor, put a tremendous amount of pressure on a Republican assembly if we could get the Senate, which 100% right now, 100% of the senators support this, if we could get the Senate and the governor talking on the same page. It would take a lot of people, but I believe it's doable. Thank you. The bottom line is that voters should choose their representatives, not the other way around. And when districts are gerrymandered, it's the other way around. My work and my advocacy for nonpartisan redistricting goes back decades. I helped start the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign, ran that group as its director for 15 years, worked for redistricting reform. When the Republicans were gerrymandering the state, we actually drew alternative maps and showed how you could create over 80 competitive legislative districts instead of the few dozen that are competitive under the gerrymandered plan. 
But in 2009 and 2010, when Democrats held the governor's office in both houses of the legislature, I was up at the Capitol begging them to take action for redistricting reform, and they told me to get lost. The legislative leaders said, we're not going to do it. So yes, Democrats and Republicans know how to gerrymander, and in either case, the losers are the voters. Because voters don't live in districts where they have an, an honest shot at choosing either party as their representation. I also um, would, pull, would push through an Iowa Commission model, but there's a very graphic illustration. In 2012, the Democrats got 200,000 more votes than the Republicans. We got 53% of the votes, but we got 39% of the assembly seats. They got 60, we got 39. As a result, right to work passed. Now, right to work is not the will of the majority of the state. Act 10 is not the will of the majority of the state. Prevailing wage, getting rid of it, not the will of the majority. Freezing the minimum wage, not the will of the majority. We have minority rule that's circumventing democracy. So it's got to be an Iowa Commission model because otherwise each side gets in and tries to get their own advantage. And um, I'll go one step further. I'm hoping that the Supreme Court case suddenly comes to fruition, but it's going to be several years from now. We must elect a governor now for one reason. That governor has to veto the crooked reapportionment that's coming down in 2020. But we're going to be like this for 10 more years. Thank you. up a little bit and start this time with Kelda and loop back around to Malin. All right, so uh, this is one of our members um, in the Oshkosh area who's going to share uh, about her health care issues. Hi, my name is Jenny Neary. I'm from Oshkosh. Um, in 2016, my then 17-year-old son, Cass, uh, was diagnosed with a type of cancer called non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. He had surgery to remove a tumor that was compressing his spine. He endured six brutal rounds of chemotherapy. And after that, he had to have another surgery, a spinal fusion surgery. He hasn't been in remission almost 17 months now, and we're hopeful that he'll graduate from remission to cured. He's 18 now, and he's a registered voter. The Trump administration is continuing its attempts to gut the Affordable, Affordable Care Act protections, consumer protections, including protections for uh, people who have pre-existing conditions. My question to the candidates is, what specifically will you do as governor to ensure that my son and all other Wisconsinites who are unlucky enough to get cancer or some other horrible medical condition will not be denied insurance, charged more for insurance, forced into substandard coverage, or otherwise face discrimination? Jenny, thank you so much for the question and sharing your story. We have got to ensure health care for all, and long term, the solution to this is Medicare for all. We have to have a single payer system. I long been to do that since before I first went to office, and that's one reason I've been endorsed by Demand Universal Health Care. In the legislature, I helped expand Badger Care to 80,000 Wisconsinites, and as governor, I will ensure that we enshrine in state law the protections of Obamacare against pre existing conditions, lifetime limits, all that things, and we increase the medical loss ratio over time. Of course, all of us on this panel want to uh, take the Medicaid expansion money. That's no brainer. Um, I want to set up an exchange under the Affordable Care Act and, and make Badger Care a public option that anyone can buy into. As a small business owner, it's an economic issue as well. Um, we want to make sure people have access to mental health coverage, affordable prescription drugs, and we stop the price gouging, and access to reproductive rights as well. Fundamentally, health care is a human right, and it's about time we started treating it like one. And I really um, am wishing the best for Cass and his future. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Healthcare is my passion. It's the reason why I ran for the legislature in the first six months that I was in the legislature. I joined with two of my colleagues in the Senate to pass a universe, to write and pass a universal health care bill called Healthy Wisconsin that covered everyone and saved a billion dollars. I strongly believe that we need universal health care and we need a Wisconsin solution. And Wisconsin can't wait for the Medicare for All bill to pass at the federal level. We've got to do it now. I know health care inside and out. As a mom, I, I had that difficult call where my son needed emergency surgery. 
and we didn't have insurance. And fifteen thousand dollar bill later, we had to take out a second mortgage, and he survived. So I know the struggles that, that you feel, but this is a solvable problem. We can do this, and it's very important that people know that there are steps that we can take at the state level, and I would be glad to tell you a lot more about it. Then. <laughs> Growing up on the farm, I wasn't covered by health insurance until the age of 22. Because our family made the decision to forego health insurance in order to remain profitable as, as a farm operation. That didn't make me an exception. There are people all over the state of Wisconsin in that same circumstance. I do want America to eventually have a single-payer Medicare for all system. That has to be the goal. But I also want Wisconsin to be a national leader, a model for the nation to follow. We need to correct two mistakes and then we need to take one other step. We need to correct the mistake that was made in, in refusing the Medicaid expansion money. We need to correct the mistake that was made when Wisconsin opted not to create its own state health insurance exchange. And then we do need to make Badger Carry public option and put it on that insurance exchange and make it available to anyone to enroll regardless of income. Thank you. I, uh, I believe that Medicare should cover everybody from birth to death. And while a governor of Wisconsin can't mandate that, a good governor of Wisconsin can advocate strongly. And I've talked to members of the business community who are coming to the realization that the real issue is containment of health care costs. And they realize that it would be cheaper for them, cheaper to pay a bigger Medicare tax but be absolved of all of these private payments. And I think it's an exciting avenue that I'm going to pursue. Secondly, I would go out there, that billion dollars in Medicare money is still there, the Medicaid money, and I will go out and get it. And he turned it down because he was running for president and wanted to look like a conservative. And that, I think that was an immoral decision, frankly, an immoral decision. But the other thing that I would do is um, there is so much discrimination in the insurance industry in terms of uh, inpatient coverage and turning people down. I would put a consumer advocate and the insurance commissioner's office with license to sue these companies because they've abused a lot of people. You know, the, the number one killer of uh, firefighters in our country is actually cancer. It's occupational cancer. Um, so I sympathize and, and I greatly uh, to share your story. Uh, we, we lose about one firefighter a year in the state of Wisconsin due to cancer. And nationally, it's the number one killer of firefighters across the country. Um, but healthcare, I believe, is a right. And you know, I'm a firefighter. We we like to make things easier. We put the wet stuff and the hot stuff, right? So fire, healthcare is a right. And we can if we can give four and a half billion dollars to Foxconn, we can damn sure insure every person in this state. So to me, it's that simple. We have over 300,000 Wisconsinites right now that have no healthcare whatsoever. There's no doubt we should have taken the federal dollars and expanded Medicaid. That would put another 84,700 folks on health care. But we need a public option. We need universal health care and badger care for all. So to me, that's the easy question. Health care is a right. It shouldn't be an option or something you have to decide if you need it or not. Everyone needs proper health care. We can do that here in our state. Thank you. All right, our next question is on long-term care um, from our member Sharon Lachlan, who is very passionate about this issue. Besides being a member of the Northeast Wisconsin Co-op, I'm also a member of the Brown County Dementia Friendly Coalition. People with disabilities, including those with disabilities that come with age, um, need what's called long-term care. There's a critical and growing shortage of workers in, this, in Wisconsin who provide this care. Um, this is something that's been identified by the advocacy groups in this field. The situation will intensify as Wisconsin population ages. One of the causes is the historical tendency to devalue professions that are usually filled by women. Um, and we pay them poverty wages and offer few benefits. What would you do to dramatically increase the number of care workers in Wisconsin? Do you believe that there must be specific investments in caregiving to make it an attractive profession 
that will draw workers needed to help seniors and people with disabilities live fulfilling and independent lives. Thank you very much for your question. It's the first time in all the forums we've done that we've had a long term care question. I really appreciate it. I spent five years as a nurse's aide. I started working when I was 14. So I, I very much know the story that you're telling. And this is a, a problem that is solvable in the governor's budget. What we need to do is pay nursing homes more and pay personal care workers that work outside the nursing homes more. What I did in the alternatives that I wrote to the governor's budget was to show how to do that with the same dollars in the budget, without raising taxes, but by rearranging the existing money that's in the budget. We can do this, and it's very important that we do it immediately, because we are now, depending on what year you look at, we, we are last or are, are almost last in terms of the way that the state reimburses for nursing homes, which means 70% of the nursing home budget is personnel, which means it directly affects the people that are providing the care. It's a solvable problem. It is a solvable problem. Um, one thing you may not know about me is that I was once a Peace Corps volunteer and lived in the West African country of Mali. Somebody I got to know there had an opportunity to travel to this country and visit for a month. One of his strongest impressions visiting this country, he came back and we talked and he said, he said, you treat your most precious resource as refuse. Oh, he visited a nursing home. That is something we have to come to terms with, is that we, we owe it, we have a duty to treat our seniors with dignity. And it does mean paying care workers more. It does mean raising the reimbursement rate for nursing homes so that they can operate and provide the kind of care that they need. My wife is a social worker, works for an aging and disability resource center. There was an attempt to do away with ADRCs. And, and we have to protect those kinds of resources so that they are there. Again, this is a, a great example of why we desperately need a new kind of leadership and a, a different morality in the governor's office. There's several issues here. One is wages, one is health care for health care workers. And one of the reasons why I would open up graduate care for everybody in the state is precisely for that reason, with a sliding scale of premiums. But the second thing ultimately is, many of the assisted living facilities for the elderly in the state are occupied by people, almost all of whom are on some governmental assistance, Medicare, Medicaid. And um, when the Republicans like Ryan and Trump keep attacking Medicare itself, attacking Social Security, there really is um, almost a death sentence to all the people of the state. We've got to revamp it totally. Before we can get Medicare covering everybody, uh, I would take the billion dollars extra. I would raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. There's nothing like some money in your pocket to make you feel good about your job and to give you a dignified life. So with an increase in the minimum wage and health care for health care workers, uh, I think that that will incentivize that industry and treat people fairly and result in better care for our patients. Thank, thank you. Um, you. You know, we're all going to be there one day, right? I mean, that's the reality of it all. Um, so I've been endorsed by the Service Employees International Union. They represent about 6,000 folks in the state, majority of those um, home health care providers. So I wanted to go out and do a day in a life. And I worked with a young lady named Denise in Milwaukee, who's a home health care provider, makes very little money, can barely afford her own health care, but she's providing health care for someone else at their home. And it was back-breaking, tedious, hard work. And I did it for two hours with one client, and she had six more clients, and she does it six days a week. There is no doubt that we need to take care of our most vulnerable. I, I do that every day as a firefighter. We respond to seniors all the time, and we, and we, we treat them well, because we will all be there. But I also link it back to pre-K. We have to take care of early childhood, and we have to take care of people when they're, when they're in their most vulnerable state. So um, I, I saw my grandmother go through dementia. It is a horrible, hellish thing. But we have to make sure we take care of our most vulnerable. To, 
So here's a problem with going last when you have five great candidates. I agree with everything that everyone has said. Uh, we certainly do have to raise the minimum wage. You know, my, my older stepdaughter, Erin, is 17. She just graduated from high school. She decided she wanted to get her CNA. She's very interested in healthcare. And she described coming home from one of her training days, eight hours, and the work that she did was more demanding and more difficult than the work that I'm doing running for governor, a statewide campaign with two kids under five. This is tough work, and we need to value it, and it is gendered, and there's also racial disparities in wages. Um, and so we have to value caregiving and value caregivers. And part of the way we do that is by enacting universal paid family leave in this state. It would help attract younger people, which we're losing in droves. It would help take the burden off of small businesses. And it would make sure that people who have to take time off to have a baby or care for a loved one who's sick or dying or themselves are sick, don't lose their livelihood. We have to do it. And we also have to do the same for early childhood and make it universal. All right, our next question is on reproductive rights from one of our members in Appleton who's active on our health care committee. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, speaking as someone who has benefited tremendously from birth control, um, I have five children, four would have been too many. Speaking as someone who has benefited tremendously from birth control, I have three children and four would have been too many. I want to know what would you do to make birth control more affordable and accessible to Wisconsinites, regardless of age and economic status? We need to make comprehensive women's health care available and accessible regardless of where you live. And growing up in a rural area of the state, one of the realities I'm very well aware of is that when it comes to, whether it's access to birth control or abortion services or any other dimension of comprehensive women's health care, and I have to say right up front that I am pro-choice, no ifs, ands, or buts. But I also am deeply committed to making sure that regardless of where you live, you are within reach of those services. And I tell you, for some of these services, it might be a trip all the way across the state or even over the border to find that because the clinics aren't there, the services aren't there where rural populations live. We have to address that. We have to commit our state to making sure that where there is access to comprehensive women's health care in one place, that that same degree of service is available anywhere regardless of where you live in this state. Thank you. Very good question. Um, I'm a strong supporter of Planned Parenthood, and quite frankly, Planned Parenthood is one of the greatest dispensers of contraception to women who can't afford it. One of the things that has always puzzled me is this. The studies have shown that if every woman had access to contraception, abortions would fall by 80%. Now, I don't know why people wouldn't think that was a good idea everywhere. So I'm a strong, strong proponent of it and women's rights to control their own bodies. And I want to point out something else. One of the arguments that the Republicans are starting to make is that it would be expensive. Well, it's, the alternative is expensive, but I get back to something I said originally. Our, government, our budget will be strangled for 15 years by the skeleton hand of our obligations in the Foxconn deal. And that's got to be talked about more. That money is absolutely necessary. And all of us are, I think, uh, of the same mind on this issue, but we need money, a lot of it, in our budget, and we've got to stop that deal, too. So thank you. You know, a lot of people uh, talk about 2011 and 12 as talking about Act 10, um, but there were a lot of other things that happened um, that we don't talk about, and, and one is tort reform, um, but another one is Planned Parenthood being under attack. That's where it started, at least in our state. In Planned Parenthood, where you had 12,000 women that used to go to Planned Parenthood, not for the woman's right to choose, mind you, but just for basic health care needs, was under attack, and it was cut. And uh, I brought, actually, probably about 15 or 20 firefighters to a Planned Parenthood rally uh, with our backpacks, with our flags, because uh, injustice to one is an injustice to all, we all know that. So we need to, you can't clap, I only get 30 seconds. <laughs> but, um, 
there's no doubt. I don't believe that doctors or government especially should be in, in a woman's uh, have anything to do between a woman and her doctor. So I'm pro-choice. Um, but we need to do everything we can to have access, not only proper health care, but have access for everyone in rural areas and in, in communities of color, have actually adequate access to health care so people can get good, adequate health care. Thank, thank you. This is the first time we've been asked about reproductive rights in these dozens of forums. And I have been a champion throughout my entire career Starting in high school and I volunteered for Planned Parenthood. Um, after law school, I didn't take a high-priced corporate job. I went to fight on the front lines for reproductive rights as the executive director of NARAL Pro-Choice America, uh, Wisconsin. I've been endorsed by Emily's List and by NARAL Pro-Choice America because they know that I will be the strongest champion for women in the state. And this is a moral issue about women controlling our own destinies, but it is also an economic issue that affects every family in the state, just like equal pay, just like affordable child care. We need to have somebody in our governor's office who knows how to make progress and will prioritize these issues. Reproductive hair care is health care. Women's rights are human rights, period. I am uncompromising on this because this goes to a fundamental humanity of women and men. We need to do this and prioritize it. So I really appreciate your asking this question, Jane. Thank you. My sister almost died of a self-induced abortion. And she um, she survived. And, but she um, showed me in a very personal way that if abortion is not safe, legal, and accessible, women will die. Right. Women will die. So the onerous, horrid um, restrictions that have been put on access to health care in the last access to women's health care in the last eight years need to be repealed. The 80 or 94 percent of the budget for women's reproductive health that the governor took away need to be put back, and I did that in, altern in my alternative budget. But also, I used to teach uh, health education, and I taught sex education a long time ago. And we must have medically-based sex education in schools from kindergarten all the way up so that we prevent unwanted pregnancies. And kids know what they need to know. All right, we're going to transition now to a question about the environment and green jobs um, from one of our Green Bay members, Casey Hicks, who is also the newest organizer uh, for League of Conservation Voters. So uh, not too long ago, President Trump pulled out from the Paris Climate Accords, which uh, is risking a future climate crisis that could disproportionately affect lower income in rural communities. So what immediate and concrete steps, as governor, would you take to make sure that Wisconsin is making the steps towards a 100% renewable energy future uh, with a benchmark of 50% by 2030. And then at the same time, what would you also do during that transition to make sure that uh, sustainable, family-supporting jobs and union jobs are being created in the process? Thanks. Yes, Matt, you can say. I think that's one of the most important issues facing the state right now. Um, a lot of studies have shown that wind power alone, but certainly wind and solar, can provide all of our energy in a shorter timeline than you mentioned. Part of it is institutional opposition from large companies, but part of it also is from some inertia. And all the studies have also shown that just create um, manufacturing the technology for the wind farms and for the solar to produce the kind of jobs you're talking about. Um, I think we've got to change our orientation of thinking on this subject. I would, as a state, declare us that we were um, in favor of the, the Paris uh, Climate Accord. I would just come out and say it as an executive order. I've told you I'll stop Foxconn. They're not polluting Lake Michigan, and they're not going to fill in wetlands, and they're not coming to our state. But the other thing that I would do is have an independent DNR, uh, put the, the climate change back on their website, have them elect the chair so that the governor is not controlling that chair, and clean up the water in the state. We have become a water farm for corporate polluters, and this governor won't tolerate that. Then. We well, talked about Donald Trump in the uh, Paris Accord, and I, I, I've never said this about a sitting president, whether it be Republican or Democrat. 
but Donald Trump is an idiot and an asshole. And I, and I didn't say it for applause, I said it because it's true. Um, but, you know, we have to make sure that we, we make the DNR actually and make Wisconsin believe in science again, right? Um, we have to bring back the scientists, bring back the engineers before we do anything. I agree with Matt, we have to depoliticize the DNR and make sure that we are taking care of our greatest asset. One of our greatest assets is our natural resources here in the state. And to have someone like Foxconn pump 7 million gallons of water a day out of Lake Michigan is ridiculous. We have to stop that. Um, but we can be, and it's not just a, one of moral ethics, we can be one of the greatest states when it comes to renewable energy. It's also one of economics. Just think how many jobs can be created if we were actually taking an active and aggressive role in making sure that we have renewable energy as, as number one on our priority list. So yes, I would be very interested in uh, renewable energy and actually our DNR and our, our natural resources in our state. Please keep it to 60 seconds. Yeah. Will do. <laughs> hey, I follow, I follow uh, the directions. So Casey, uh, there are very detailed plans on my website, caldaforgovernor.com, to address these issues as well as our, our larger questions about conservation and the environment. But we're, one of the tenth, we're the tenth most moved out of state in the nation. And if we want to reverse that, if we want people my age, and middle age, 40s, 30s, and younger people in their 20s and teens, to make a life in a future here in Wisconsin, we have got to go with the things that make it special to live here. And one of those things is our natural resources. Wisconsin has an amazing heritage as a leader in conservation. The DNR, you know, Aldo Leopold, John Muir, we have this great conservation legacy and we are throwing it away. This is an issue of making Wisconsin a leader again, restoring science, restoring the DNR, but it's also an issue of building a new economy that is gonna create family supporting jobs for people all over the state. There are 200 companies right now in Wisconsin in the sensors and controls uh, vertical, and we could be empowering these companies to grow by investing in wind and solar and geothermal and smart grids. There's so much we can do, and I'm excited to get to work on that. If you think climate change doesn't exist, look outside the window. So we had 200 year floods back to back in, in my district and in the north. We just had another flood last week with 10 inches of rain. Right now, the state is woefully unprepared to deal with climate change. What do we need to do specifically? We need to put hire back the scientists, bring back the Bureau of Science Services, make sure that make, make sure that the the governor puts back in place the Office of Energy Independence, which works across the entire entirety of state government to make sure that all of the pieces that we need to put in place actually happen so that all of state government, from the Department of Transportation to the Department of Military Affairs, deals with the effects of climate change and preventing future climate change. We need to pass the Clean Energy Jobs Act or some version of it, and we need to change and bring back all of those good union-supporting jobs by fixing things like prevailing wage and project labor agreements and all that anti-labor bills that have passed in the last few years. I mentioned in my opening remarks that I think it should be Wisconsin's goal to become the first state in the nation fully powered by renewable energy. But here's the reality that we face. We are lagging badly. We're not making a serious effort to compete in that race. And why? There's an energy revolution going on in our country. Businesses are going toward a renewable energy future. Individual families are pursuing that future. But as they hit the accelerator, our own government hits the brakes. It says, whoa, not so fast. And, and continues to subsidize and incentivize fossil, a fossil fuel economy instead of a renewable energy economy. And renewable energy is the right thing to do, not only for the environment and our planet, it's the right thing to do for our economy. If we were just at the Midwestern average for producing clean energy jobs, if we could just get up to the average of where our Midwestern neighbors are, that would be 30,000 more people employed in the clean energy sector in Wisconsin. What this is about is standing up to oil and gas and coal interests and putting our government on the side of that energy revolution. Our next question is uh, from Tim Drager. It's about affordable 
uh, higher care education. Tim is a returning student, uh, non-traditional at UW Students Point. Thank you. There are five two-year campuses here in the north. Five two-year campuses here in the northeast that uh, that help to make college more affordable for families here. You support free tuition at the two-year campuses and the UW and four-year campuses. And what obstacles would you see in achieving this? And what would you do to make college more affordable for every student, regardless of their family's economic status? So I was the uh, 2016 Bernie Sanders delegate at the convention. And uh, he talked a lot about free college, free college, and that's great. Uh, but my dad always said, you know, I'm mailing there, I'm on free lunches. So I came up with a plan. Actually, my 14-year-old my son at the time inspired him. They play video games now. I want to see how long people play video games. They did it for 12 hours one day. I couldn't believe it. So I said, we're not going to pay for him to have college just without him doing anything. So we actually have a pay it forward program. It's going to be earned tuition. Where from fifth grade to 12th grade, you're actually going to put down your phone, put down the video games, and actually do community service. You're going to volunteer at the homeless shelter. You're going to volunteer at the Boys and Girls Club. You're going to volunteer to help our veterans who have served this country at the vet center. And you're going to volunteer to help the senior in your community that actually can't shovel the snow and can't afford to pay someone to do it. And then, when you get to fifth to twelfth grade, in twelfth grade, when you get your diploma, walk across the dais, you're actually get a certificate of completion from the state saying that we're going to provide you two years of earned tuition because you've earned it, you paid it for, and we'll have a loan forgiveness program for year four once you stay in the state five to six years and pay taxes, raise a family, whatever you got to do. That's my plan. <laughs> And for my stepdaughters who you know have a lot of time and resources and parents that can take them and help support them in that but I think we need to make sure that every student in the state regardless of their economic circumstances their access to transportation um, what, with their involvement of their parents can go to any two-year institution in the state tuition free we've also got to restore state support for the University of Wisconsin system yes. period we've got 600 million dollars in cuts and that is wrong State support has gone from about 50% of the UW's budget down to 15%. And they're making up the difference in tuition. Here's the thing. I went to school, and a lot of people in this room went to school uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 10 years ago. We are carrying student loan debt. We have got to address this crisis for generations of Wisconsinites. It is holding back nearly a million borrowers across this state holding back our economy and delaying and denying our life decisions for Gen Xers like me and our friends the Millennials. We need to address the student loan debt crisis first and foremost to make sure that we can unleash the power of our economy and have a bright future and enough money for the universities in the future. I strongly support uh, free tuition. I have written the bill in 2013 and again in 2017 to do this. It is 100% paid for. I believe it's a very good trade-off with manufacturers and many of the businesses looking for a skilled workforce. What we need to do is have free tuition for two-year in tech colleges and a massive infusion of needs-based financial aid for the UW system. In addition to fully paying for this, I also fully paid for putting all of the money that was taken away from the UW system. So, and in addition to the $100 million that I mentioned on, on, um, on the uh, needs-based tuition or needs-based financial aid, when you think about our problems in the Wisconsin workforce, we have the 18th worst lowest wages in the United States. Of all states, 18th worst. We can solve this problem by giving people a hand up to get the skills that they need. I want Wisconsin to recognize that tuition is not the only expense when you go to school. There's books, there's food, there's housing. And I, I want to be more I want Wisconsin to be more ambitious. I want the goal to be debt-free education. I, I worked my way through four years of college and came out the other end with $770 in student debt. And when I say that on college campuses, they just about faint debt away, those students do. They average is about $30,000 in debt. Now I met a young woman with $150,000 in student debt recently. Why has this happened? It's because past generations had this mentality that all of us were better off when a, when a student got the education and, and job skills they needed. And now the mentality is you're on your own. It's up to you and your family to do the paying. And don't ask us, the rest of us, to pay it. 
We've got to change that mentality and get back to the idea that all of us are in this together and we're all better off when any young person gets the education that gives them a path to the American dream. An educated citizenry is the greatest asset any state can have. And here are my action items now I'd pay for them. I would provide two years free tuition across the board, not just for technical colleges, but also for university and two-year colleges. Secondly, I would put in a student loan authority where we would guarantee up to a certain amount student debt, which would lower the interest rates and can be done. And then the third thing I'd do would be to tell you how I'm gonna pay for this. Get rid of the manufacturer's credit, that's a billion dollars, that doesn't see the manufacturing job, number one. Number two, Bill Foxconn, four and a half billion, it ain't happening with Matt Flynn. I'm sorry I keep talking about it, even in inappropriate questions, but I feel very strongly about it. Three, get the billion dollars back for Medicaid money. Four, the 800 billion in train money. Get cash back into it and put it in education, public education, the UW system, one of the greatest universities in the world. Uh, I'm going to build it up, get rid of, uh, put back statutory tenure, reaffirm the mission statement. Thank you very much. is being read by Nettie McGee, one of our members from rural Allegheny County, um, who has previously run for county board. Act 10 and labor rights. Would you support immediately repealing Act 10, so-called right to work, and all the legislative enactments that make it impossible to create project labor agreements, and local measures that promote family supporting union jobs? If you do not have majorities in the legislature, would you vigorously deploy executive authority to restore union rights in Wisconsin, and if so, how? Okay. Nettie, yes, I would. And I had the privilege of serving in the assembly and being the Democratic Caucus Chair when our current governor came in and dropped the bomb, when he divided and conquered us. And I helped hold, hold the floor for 63 hours as we fought Act 10 and tried to get the stories out about what it was going to do to our economy, what it was going to do to our schools. And now we see the effects eight years later, right? Schools can't keep teachers, uh, especially in rural districts and in urban districts, which have high need and can't afford to pay. Even our prisons and correctional institutions are becoming less safe. I was proud to stand with labor from day one to stop Act 10. And I think that's one of the things that sets me apart in this race, because I held testimony night after night in that Capitol, all night long, listening to people all around the state. I even moved my uh, office out under the frozen ground when they locked that Capitol down, because I will stand with working people. And as an employer, I can't imagine not sitting down with my employees to talk about wages and benefits and working conditions and making this state better for the people that we all serve together. I was one of the Wisconsin 14 that left the state to stop at I have, I'm born and bred a union person. My dad dug ditches and was part of the International Laborers Union. I have lived the life of, of a gap growing up as a member of the, as a teacher, as a professor, I was a member and executive member of the AFT, my, my union at the university I taught at. So I haven't run from the label over and over and over again in the legislature. We have, we have introduced bills as Democrats in the Senate to repeal the project labor agreement, to the um, right to work, this, every part of this fight I have been in in the last eight years. What do we need to do if we cannot get the legislature? We need to show to the state, what and the, all the people in the state, what Act 10 has done to the morale of the people in the state, to the safety of those people who are working in the state, to the, to the teachers that have complete X, many of them have completely left the field. There's a lot that we can do. And, and let's begin by getting Democrats elected so that we have the votes to do this. I believe that belonging to a union should be a civil right. That, is, that involves amending Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, and it should be done, because everybody should have a right to join a union. We have to deal with the reality in America today that one in ten American workers has union representation. 
And when you take the public sector out of the equation, it's 1 in 15. 6% of American workers have union representation. We've got to give more people a path to union representation. But we also have to be real clear that we are not just pro-union, we are pro-worker. And we'll fight like crazy for the, the, the rights and the needs of working people regardless of whether they have union representation. That's incredibly important. We've got to change the conversation. Don't call it right to work. It is a wage suppression policy, and I want to do away with all wage suppression policies. We've been told, propagandized for decades, that higher wages will kill jobs. No! Low wages are a killer for our economy. They suppress demand. They inhibit sales. We have got to put more money in the pockets of working people. When they get that money in their pockets, they will spend it. Somebody's got to sell what they want to buy. That will stimulate the economy. The median wage adjusted for inflation today is lower than it was 10 years ago. The whole objective of the Republican Party is to squash wages, all right? Here are my action items. I'll repeal Act 10. My wife uh, was a lifetime, we're a lifetime, we're a union household, she's a lifetime WAC member, and about eight of her friends in County Line School in Germantown just quit. They retired when that came in because they were afraid of their benefits. It has demoralized teachers. I'll repeal Act 10, I'll repeal right to work, so-called. Restore prevailing wage and raise the minimum wage. If the Republican legislature is still the Republican legislature, I will use the executive power to mandate that on state building projects we're going to have prevailing wage and union jobs. And I'm going to ram it to them and ram it to them until I veto their reapportionment and we get a Democratic legislature in there. Raising the minimum wage is very important. And the reason for that is it's been frozen right now. Adjusted for inflation, the minimum wage in 1968 was over $10 an hour. Now it's seven in these, in these dollars. This is wrong, and what's happening is there's wages being suppressed. I'm proud of it. Thank you. The quick answer is yes. Uh, when, I, when we were exempt from Act 10, uh, the firefighters and police officers, quite frankly, came out against Act 10, even though we were told to sit with our exemption and, and keep quiet. So yes, I would fight like hell to repeal Act 10. Right to work is a horrible law. Prevailing wage needs to come back. Um, so that was actually easy. I still got 30 seconds left. So I actually want to tell you a little story. I want to tell you a little story because when Senator Vinal wasted her coffee, it made me think. When I ran, when I ran against Lieutenant, sorry, sorry, but when I ran against Lieutenant Governor Clayfish, we were doing a joint appearance on the Mike Boucher show, and uh, in between takes, and we we're just about to go on. She took her coffee and she went to drink it, and actually the cap came off, and all the coffee spilled down her dress. And, and she flipped it back up on upper face, and I went actually and got towels, like we just did here, and got towels to help her out. And she goes, you know what, Malin, thanks for helping me out. You didn't have to do that. It shows good sportsmanship. I know we're not on the same side, but thank you for being a gentleman. I said, no problem, Lieutenant Governor. This is just another time where Democrats are cleaning up the Republicans' mess once again. <laughs> addiction issues 
over 30%, I heard this week 38% have diagnosed severe mental illness, and 10% are developmentally disabled. So people are being institutionalized in prison for, for things that need treatment. I'm a strong proponent for treatment instead of incarceration. We need to obviously take the Medicaid expansion money, but in doing that, we need to take the money that's freed up, $286 million, and create a community-based mental health and addiction recovery system, which is what Minnesota did back in the 1970s. This is a totally solvable problem. We need to review the census. Folks are being incarcerated for way too long. Wisconsin has a state budget that spends more on prisons than the entire university system. Yeah. We literally spend more locking people up than we do on unlocking human potential. And it's true. Minnesota imprisons half as many people as Wisconsin, yet our two states have virtually identical crime rates. So Wisconsin has not reduced crime by locking up twice as many people. All we've done is doom our state to a budget that spends more on prisons than the entire university system. To deal with that, we have got to stop locking up nonviolent offenders. Yes. We've got to use alternative approaches. That's why I have come out in favor of full legalization of marijuana. Woo. For personal use, for medical use, for agricultural purposes. We have got to stop locking up nonviolent offenders, use yeah. alternative approaches to sentencing when it's nonviolent offenses. We've got to invest in mental health and drug treatment as Minnesota does so much better than Wisconsin. And when we do that, it is an incredibly realistic goal to say that our prison population can be cut in half and we can reverse that dismal reality where we spend more locking people up than unlocking human potential. So here are my action items. Uh, I will legalize marijuana for all purposes and tax and regulate it. I'll also pardon everybody in our prison and jail system who's there for marijuana possession offense. If it's legal in Colorado, it should not be a felony or misdemeanor in Wisconsin. Secondly, I'll require judges to certify what the cost is of their excessive sentences. And if they have to run for election saying that I sentenced this person to you know, $2 million worth of expenditure, uh, they're not going to be so quick to do that in the future. I will get rid of... Uh, uh, excessive solitary confinement. I'll put a limit on it, it's a sadistic practice, and we're not gonna tolerate that going forward anymore. And also, crimeless revocation of parole. I think that that's wrong. I think that uh, people that are revoked simply because they were two minutes late to a meeting is wrong, and I'm gonna significantly reduce, I will be at the biggest pardon board that any governor's ever had, and we're gonna review any sentence that they look, they show to me, and the presumption is gonna be lower it or let them out. Uh, and we uh, and we need the money to do it, and I'm, I have to stop at this point. <laughs> For some reason, every time we talk about uh, uh, crime and, and prison reform and criminal justice reform, we always talk about legalizing marijuana. I think we all are in agreement that we will legalize marijuana, but we don't talk about crimes of poverty and, and what's happening actually in communities of color. You know, not everybody smokes marijuana in communities of color. Right? That's not, that's, that's not the economic opportunity for everyone in the communities of color. And that's serious. Um, we put more African American males behind bars than any other state in the country. That's not a Republican issue, that's not a Democrat issue. That's a people issue. So we need to look at that. So crime with revocations, yes, we need to get rid of that. We look at the truth and sentencing we have in our state is ridiculous. Um, the earned release program, being addicted is not a crime. So we need to make sure people get the mental health they need and the substance abuse help they need. Yeah. Um, we gotta ban the box. And the F, we ask, we ask people to reactivate with society, but then we don't give them the tools or the ability to even get a job or even to make their case in front of a potential employer to actually talk about what happened. And we're seeing crime and poverty. So we don't we will not stop any of this until we actually, I know I gotta stop, until we actually create opportunities for communities of color. When I was a first year law student, almost 20 years ago, my criminal law professor, who had been the DOC secretary decades ago, said there's only two reasons that you put somebody in prison and you incarcerate someone. Number one is public safety, and number two is just punishment. The system that we have now really does neither. It wastes our human capital, it wastes our financial resources, and it makes Wisconsin 
It contributes to the fact that Wisconsin is the worst place in the nation to grow up as an African-American child. And I don't want to raise my white children in a state that is the worst place to grow up as an African-American child. We have to address racial disparities, and that starts with mass incarceration, but it certainly doesn't end there. I have detailed plans on my website for how we can reduce the prison population in this state dramatically and be more like Minnesota's. I have detailed plans for how we're going to address the opioid crisis and legalize marijuana. But it takes a governor with a political will and, frankly, the know-how to do it. I have the experience of turning big ideas into real results, including on criminal justice, where I work with some of the most conservative legislators to help prevent wrongful convictions in Wisconsin. Our next question is on gun violence prevention. Um, one of our amazing leaders in Appleton, who is a retired educator and monster. Thank you, Julie, and thank you, candidates, for being here today. I am a local advocate in Fox City's gun violence prevention team in Appleton, and uh, I want to address you today uh, in honor of the students that I know of that are in Janesville today. Yes. Meeting with those uh, courageous students from Parkland, Florida, who have taken action and brought the country uh, together in action. So students in Northeast Wisconsin have been very active in the movement to prevent gun violence in our schools and communities by organizing marches, walkouts, and town halls. As governor, what specifically would you do to address the demands of students in Wisconsin and nationally? to ensure that all youth have a safe school environment, home environment, and a safe community to thrive. Because as we know, and I'm going off script, gun violence doesn't only affect our schools. It affects, could affect our library, okay? Anywhere that we are in our communities, we can all be affected and in our homes. Gun suicides is huge. So it isn't simply a school issue, but these students are being the place. So thank you. As, as I told you, I grew up on a farm, which means that I'm from farm country, hunting country, gun country. Yes, I've come out in favor of 16 different steps that we can take to deal with gun violence and, and deal with the underlying causes of these mass shootings. You, you don't need a 30 round clip to go hunting. If you need 30, 30 rounds, you're a really horrible hunter. You don't need bump stocks to turn a regular gun into a machine gun. We can have 48 hour waiting periods. We can have comprehensive criminal background checks. We can, I've, I've come out for 16 different steps that would make communities and schools safer and would save lives. And it doesn't require repealing the Second Amendment or stopping people from hunting or telling law-abiding people that they can't own guns, but we can, we can deal with this problem if we are willing to stand up to the NRA. The National Group Moms Demand Action has been looking around the country for gun sense candidates. They gave me that distinction. I'm a gun sense candidate. But I'll tell you what, we're never going to get more than thoughts and prayers from elected officials as long as they are paid to take no other action. We've got to deal with that problem underneath this problem. Here are my action items. As a military veteran, I'm able to talk about this issue with some credibility around the state having acquired some weapons. And here's the deal. The, the Second Amendment is part of the Bill of Rights, so I support the Second Amendment. And for civilian weapons, uh, handguns, shotguns and rifles for hunting, absolutely. But military wannabes should not have access to military weapons. We don't let them have access to nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, shoulder-held missile launchers, or machine guns, and we shouldn't let them have access to weapons that can be converted into machine guns, pure and simple. And that is military assault rifles or bump stocks or anything else. How about waiting periods and, no, and background checks, mandatory, and no more private gun sales, gun shows, I do not want military wannabes showing up because they're too lazy or too afraid to join the military and learn how to use these weapons. So no, I'm serious about this. I say it right that, just like that, but the Second Amendment, yes, for civilian weapons. Thank you. 
you know, we have to do everything in our power to make sure our kids are safe at school. I have a son who's in eighth grade, and that scares the hell out of me to think that uh, uh, someone could come in and shoot their school. So I've actually come out in full support of banning AR-15s and, and uh, semi-assault rifles or semi-automatic rifles. We couldn't even get Congress to ban bump stocks, which is, is insane. Um, but I always tell my members, the firefighters I represent around the state, that you know when they hear Democrats talk about guns, they get nervous. And I've also been endorsing uh, the gun um, mom's demand action. But my members get a little bit nervous when they hear Democrats talk about that. And I always tell them like, no one's coming after your 30 on six, after your hunting rifle. That's fine. We have a rich tradition of hunting in our state. Over 500,000 hunters. I even deer hunt. And I don't know what you think, like a black guy deer hunts. But yeah, <laughs> it's real. Shoulders real too, but. You know, it's a rich tradition in our state, but we have to, we can have common sense gun safety laws. And, and I believe that we need to have universal background checks, we need to have the waiting and cool off period, and we need to close the loophole at, at gun shows. So all those things we need to do to make sure that we keep our kids safe. But that's something we don't talk about real quickly when it comes to school safety is actually adequate staffing. We have to adequately staff teachers at the school. Two stepdaughters in high school and after Parkland, um, they said, you know, when we hear a door slam, we jump. My three-year-old, then three-year-old daughter described to me a new game that she and her friends had learned. And I realized as she was telling me the story, it was an active shooter drill. We cannot allow our politicians to continue to be bought and paid for by the gun manufacturer's lobby at the expense of our safety and their sense of safety. They have a right to be safe in school and to feel safe in school. That means no guns in school. Yeah. I have a detailed plan for how we can address this, and it starts with support, supporting reinstating the 48-hour waiting period, and you can see it on my website. I've also, I was the first candidate to be endorsed by Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense, the first candidate to take the No NRA Money Pledge. We have got to do something about this, and as a mom, there is really nothing more important to me than the future and safety of my kids and every kid in the state. We can do this. I'm the daughter of a hunter and a law enforcement officer, and we had guns in the house, but they don't want their grandkids dealing with this item. Thank you, and kudos to the kids for bringing this to attention of people all across this, all across the country. I serve on the Blue Ribbon Commission on School Funding Reform, and we have heard testimony all over the state about the challenges facing schools, including the problems of violence in schools. We heard recently from Birchwood over in Tur near Turtle Lake, where the school the, the school board member went door to door collecting three thousand dollars to be able to put an intercom system so that the school could lock its doors, which it hasn't done in its history until April. Next, they're gonna work on a key fob system because everybody in Birchwood, for 50 years they haven't changed the locks, and everybody in Birchwood has a key to get into the school. So this shows you the incredible hurt that has happened to schools because of the dropping of Act 10. The bomb that was called Act 10. Schools have not recovered and they haven't been able to keep our kids safe. There are many things that we need to do. And let's start with universal background checks. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our next question is on public financing of elections um, from Amanda of Fox Crossing, who is new to political organizing and very passionate about the issue of money in politics. Hi, I'm Amanda Zarin. I have three beautiful children, and before two years ago, I wasn't even involved in politics. I didn't understand it. It was too difficult to understand. But when I look at my children, and I see that their future is questionable, I realize that politics affects every aspect of the well-being of our lives. And if I don't do something to affect it, they're not going to have the bright future that they deserve. So I have vowed to fight corruption in government. And my question for the candidates is, candidates, how would you shift power back to the people and away from the corporate and big money interests, creating a more vibrant democracy by creating a public financing system? Such a system would match small donations with sufficient resources to run an effective campaign without dependence on large donors. 
and sufficient to withstand dark money influence. Furthermore, would you support Wisconsin passing a resolution indicating it would join the other states in amending the Constitution to overturn the Citizens United in Buckley versus Vallejo, doctrine that money is speech? The answer is yes, I would. And I'll tell you, um, the Citizens United uh, case was a lawless case. It ignored a century of precedent from Supreme Courts and Congresses and it was simply not a benefit for the Republican Party. And the, the darkness, so I guess I would uh, support that. But in addition, it's going to require the election of a Democratic president in 2020 to appoint new Supreme Court justices to overturn, and that's the easier way to do it. You have no idea how dark money has penetrated. I'm going to give you a couple of things. Uh, Scott Walker got a contribution, a million and a half dollars we ran for president from a man named Leonard Blavatnik, who's a, a, um, who's a Ukrainian oil magnate, pro-Russian, pro-Putin, got American citizenship, had an affiliate give it to him. And Scott Walker has never said anything about Russian hacking in this state. He's never said he won't let there be more election workers to stop it. We have no idea if Donald Trump, who brokered the Foxconn deal, got a slice for an affiliate because he won't release his income tax returns. There are dirty things going on, and you need a very tough governor in this state to stand up to it. Thank you. I don't think Matt Flynn likes Foxconn. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody up here does, but I just, he says it literally to everyone, and it's good. Um, the answer to your question is, is, is yes. And you know, one thing that kind of gets that we don't talk about a lot in the state is the Government Accountability Board, which has been essentially defunct. And now it's called the Ethics Commission. Um, you know, the Government Accountability Board actually started because of the caucus scandal. And it was to come in and actually be a nonpartisan, essentially, overseers or commissioners over our elections. And for Governor Walker to just essentially, and in his Republican legislature, quite frankly, take that away, that's a huge problem, a huge concern. So one thing I would do as governor right away is look at campaign finance reform, make sure we bring back the Government Accountability Board. Uh, the governor has uh, doubled all contributions you can now accept. Um, you used to be able to accept 10,000 as, as a personal, now you can accept 20. In the PAC, when we used to be 43,000, now it's 86. So yes, we need to get back to Government Accountability Board and make sure the next governor fights like hell to make sure campaign finance reform is real. Yes, I support public financing for campaigns. I think we need to make sure that every person in the state, regardless of uh, whether or not you're wealthy, has a voice in government um, and a meaningful opportunity to run for office. We cannot continue to let the big money special interests run this state. And I have one track record. Again, you know, we all have big ideas and good values, but I've got a track record of actually standing up to special interests. I hope Wisconsin be one of the first states in the nation to ban BPA and keep kids safe from toxic chemicals. And you know who didn't like it? A lot of people with really deep pockets. <laughs> we need that kind of metal and courage, and we need somebody who knows how to get things done in tough political environments. Um, and I also served for a long time on the board of Common Cause, so there are a lot of issues in, in addition to public finance and campaigns that we have to address, um, lobbying, ethics. We can't have a governor who, when he breaks the law, just decides to change the law. Um, we've got to have a governor who follows the law and isn't afraid to be investigated by the government. We have seeing of Supreme Court elections. Democrats passed it back in 2009 and the governor, the current governor, took the money and got rid of the law when he came in in 2011. So it's not a question of can we do it, it's a question of when can we do it. It needs to happen. The other thing that we need to do is take the veil off of dark money. Pass a law that we passed back in 2007 and 2009 in the Senate on disclosure. We need to stop coordination between dark money and, and candidates, which was the whole problem with, the, with why the GAB got dissolved, which I fought. But when it comes right down to it, right now in the short term, the biggest thing we can do with big money is to beat it which is why we need every one of you to help us to win. Choose up your candidate. We, right now, I invite you to join us. We are running a grassroots campaign, and we're going to show how to beat it. Thank you.
my work for public financing and other campaign finance reforms didn't start when I became a candidate for governor. This has been my life's work. This has been my life's passion. And, but it's not enough for me to say that I'll work for campaign finance reform if elected governor. I, I think I've got to practice what I've preached for all those decades. I have got to walk that talk. And so I stand alone as a candidate in saying that, yes, the law says that any one of you here can pull out a checkbook right now and write out a check for $20,000 and hand it to me as a candidate for governor. I cannot in good conscience take that check because I have done work that showed me the strings that are attached to such checks and what it does to our government and to your representation. So I, I have got to practice what I preach and run a campaign that seeks to break money power with people power and we have got to run for office and win elections with a different model or we are going to continue to be doomed with a government that slavishly serves those at the very top that make those big donations and ignores the wishes of the rest of us. Thank you. All right. So that wraps up our question section of the agenda. Um, real quick before we move into closing remarks, I want to remind you all to take a minute and fill out the survey. Um, our organizing co-op wants to hear from you what you thought of these candidates. What did you like that you heard today? Um, so we can make that part of our movement here in the Northeast um, and know what issues you want to make sure you're hearing from candidates in the August primary. Um, so, we're going to give each of you 60 seconds. No, no. Take, take, take 90 seconds, we got a little bit of extra okay. time. You get 90 seconds, you're lucky. Um, 90 seconds. <laughs> All right, uh, so 90 seconds. Um, any closing remarks that you want to make? Um, anything that did not get touched on today that you want to make sure? Uh, that all of us hear from you, or things that you did not get to answer in your questions before, or whatever you want to tell us. All right, so um, let's get started. Since we did opening remarks starting on this side of the table, let's start uh, with Max for closing your remarks. Thank you very much. And just Malin, just so you know, I don't just dislike Foxconn. Okay? I will kill Foxconn. happening because we're going to have no money in this state if it happens. Period. End of story. On the, on the ship I was stationed on, we had sailors from Mississippi and from New York. And we had them from Alabama and California and Wisconsin and Arkansas and Wyoming. And, uh, we were shipmates. There was no north-south divide. There was no urban-rural divide. There was no income divide. There was no racial divide. We stood watch together. We worked together. We went on liberty together. We were shipmates. Everybody in this room is my shipmate. Everybody in the state is my shipmate. And uh, if you put this Navy vet in the governor's chair, I will turn the ship around. And I'm going to leave you with this. When I served in the Navy, I defended my country. When I served as a lawyer, I defend my clients. And when I serve as governor, I will defend you. Thank you. Thank you all for taking so many hours out of a glorious day and sitting inside to give us a chance to share thoughts with you. It means the world to us to have you all here. I said moments ago that, that we'd never get anything more than thoughts and prayers from elected officials after each new mass shooting as long as elected officials are paid to take no other action, well, we'll never get clean air and clean water from dirty politics either. Woo! And we're not going to get good health care from a sick political system. We're not going to get progress on any of the issues that we care about unless we deal with that cancer in the body of democracy that I touched on in my opening remarks. Look, I, I, we've got levels of economic inequality in our state today not seen since the Great Depression. And so far in the 21st century, no state in America has seen its middle class shrink more than Wisconsin. Right. And boy, I tell you, you think back to the Great Depression. As the country plunged into that economic trauma, the greatest president the Democratic Party ever produced said to the American people at that moment, the forces of organized money are unanimous in their hatred for me. And then he told his fellow Americans, I welcome their hatred. We need to bring that spirit back in our time. And, and I'm running for governor to do everything in my power to renew that spirit in our day. Thank you. I, I've listened to folks on this 
stage, um, not today, but other days, talk about how they imagine what it's like to, to walk in the shoes of people that... And I don't have to imagine what it's like to walk in those shoes because I've lived it. Why is free tuition so important for me for two year in tech colleges? Because when I was 18, my dad thought the college would be wasted on a girl, so he wouldn't sign my financial aid papers. So I worked my way through college, and of course I had to prove him wrong, so I got my master's degree and my PhD <laughs> and became a full-time professor. But as a dairy farmer, I've lived without health insurance. I know how important it is. And as a senator, these that we hear today are not campaign platitudes. They are the work that I have done the last 12 years in the Senate. I have showed how to write the budgets to, with the same amount of dollars to rebalance the priorities, to put health care first, to fix mass transit, to fix the roads. I know where the money is buried. I know the recommendations that the governor has ignored. And I can win. I'm from a part of the state that Democrats have to win. I won three times in a district that Scott Walker won three times and that Trump won. And I live in a county that Trump won by 70%. So I, I humbly ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you so much. My name is Kelda Roys, and I couldn't be more pleased than to be here with all of you today and to be up here with these great candidates and the others who are in the race. We have such an important decision ahead of us. It's going to determine the future of course of our state and whether or not Wisconsin is the place that we love, that we are proud of, and where every child can thrive. We can rebuild Wisconsin and make it a place of opportunity and fairness if we have responsible adults in the driver's seat again. And every person on this stage, and frankly every person on this room, has something to offer, something that we all can bring in making that Wisconsin a reality. We're going to build it together. My campaign is not about me, it's about the future of this state. And there is a reason that I've won six consecutive straw polls, including I just won one in Waukesha County this week with an absolute majority of the vote, by a two to one margin at the statewide Democratic Party convention, and it's because when people hear all of our messages, they are responding to our positive, forward-looking vision. It's not about the governor. It's not about cataloging all his failures and all the things we're sad and upset about. It's about how we together are going to build that future in Wisconsin. And if you're ready to do that, I ask you to come get on board, just like uh, my friend Andy Gronick has done, because this is about making sure not just that we win in November, but that we can govern and build a Wisconsin that we want together in January. I'm ready to do that. My name is Kelda Royce. I ask for your vote on August 14th and again on November 6th. And I ask for your partnership as we renew Wisconsin once again. Thank you so much. You know, all these things are great to talk about. Education, health care, our economy that works for everyone, African American male incarceration rate. Uh, we didn't get on infrastructure and our roads. Uh, which are terrible. Um, we can sit in this room and talk about all these things. And for the most part, we all agree on what the solution should be. But this is just, as my grandfather used to say, whistling Dixie, if we actually don't win in November. So we need a candidate that actually is building a path to victory. And I'm that candidate. I have been endorsed by Congresswoman Gwen Moore. I'm the only one up here that's actually had a sitting congressperson put their neck on the line to actually come out and endorse a campaign. I've been endorsed by a lot of labor unions. And a lot of people say, well, of course Malin gets labor unions because he comes from the House of Labor. Well, if you didn't know, the House of Labor doesn't always agree on one statewide candidate. <laughs> a lot. And I can tell you that from factual. Uh, the operating engineers, Local 139, about 10,000 men and women that build roads across the state. They have endorsed my campaign. What's unique about them is they endorsed Scott Walker the last three times. Oh. And we can say, oh, we shouldn't have them, but you know what we need? We need their votes. All right. And we need their people there. Yeah. So when I go around, and I, and I love being in rooms with people that think like me, but I go into the belly of the beast and talk to people that don't think like me and bring them back to our side. I represent the Obama Trump supporter. We need to bring black people out to vote. We have a plan to bring 50,000 more African Americans out to vote in our entire state. And if we don't do that, we do not win. So I have an office in Milwaukee, an office in Madison. We have a field office up here. We are building a path to victory and win this thing in November. 
And I appreciate your time. Go to mailmitchell.com and we got to win this damn thing. Thank you. Thank you. I want to say a really big thank you to all of our candidates today um, for coming out and speaking to all of us. I think I can speak on behalf of everyone in this room that we really appreciated hearing your responses to our questions. Thank you to all of you.